Everybody say, the way. way. Look at your neighbor say, the one and only way. way. That's what the way means, Not not one of many ways, but the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father. That's what Jesus said. If you had a Bible that you had open on your lap and it was a red letter edition, those words would be in red, which means that's words that Jesus actually spoke. And unless you think Jesus is a liar or he doesn't know what he's talking about, one of the two, you have to know that as a Christian, our stance is not uh, dictated by politics. It's not dictated by culturalism. It's not dictated by anything except the Word of God. And the Word of God, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. I don't think you could really get any clearer than that, could you? I mean, you'd be like, okay, Jesus, I got what you're saying there. And so anyway, we, uh, we anticipate the soon return of Jesus for us, don't we? Talked to you about the rapture last week, and I don't know if any of you went home and tried to Google in your concordance. I don't even know if you really know or aware of what a concordance is, but in the back, if you had a book, you know, we used to have books we read, and I know this is an ancient concept, but, but uh, we used to have books that we read, and in the back of a Bible, a lot of times, it would have a listing of the, the most important words, maybe not every single word in the Bible, but any of the big, the big words, the big concept words. And beside it, it would have a listing of scriptures that you would find that word mentioned in, and you could look at it, and it would take you to what, if it was five verses with that word, there were all five listed there, and you could see that word used in five locations in the Bible and so forth. Anyway, that's a concordance. And if you look, tried to look up the word rapture, of course, you didn't find it because it's not a Bible word. It's a word that that's... Uh, invented by us, by mankind, not me personally, but mankind to, des- to describe an event that is really an upgathering where we're called off of this earth. It's not when Jesus comes and sets his feet again on the earth. And I'm trying to make a distinction about this because I want you to be aware that as we continue on in Revelation, we're, we're going to get the concept of his upgathering as, as um, a return of Christ, but it's in the clouds. It's not actually touching the earth. Jesus touched the earth when he was born in a stable in Bethlehem. His feet actually walked on this earth. That was his first coming. Uh, many people talk about the second coming, and they, what they're talking about is the rapture. They, by many people mean when they say second coming, and I might even say that word, and I just want you to be aware that, that when you say that word, you're, you, you may be meaning, okay, the time when Jesus calls us off of this earth and we go home to be with the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, Thessalonians tells us, and, and, and the great up gathering called the rapture. But actually, the second coming is when he comes back and sets his feet on earth again. So it, I know it gets a little dicey sometimes, and for you to keep these concepts separated, you need to be able to do this because we're going to see this throughout the book of Revelation. Jesus comes the first time in Bethlehem in a manger, puts his feet on the ground. Jesus comes a second time, sets his feet on the Mount of Olives at the end of tribulation when the armies are gathered against tiny Israel to wipe them out. He speaks a word, destroys all the armies that are marshaled against tiny little Israel. The blood runs as deep as the horse's bridles. Battle of Armageddon in the Valley of Megiddo. We'll do, you'll see this extensively in the book. I mean, really, uh, you'll see it. And it's just amazing what happens and what all of that is. But we'll, and we'll get to that, but it's on deeper into the book. And then there's actually a third coming. After the battle of Armageddon, after he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and he destroys the armies of the earth, he binds up Satan for what the Bible says, Revelation says, for a little season. Now, how long is a little season? Well, I don't know. It might be 10 years or it might be 1,000 years. You know, the Bible says one day is at, with the Lord is, at, is as 10,000 years or as 8,000 years, excuse me, as 8,000 years. So, You know, if if we're talking about a day to the Lord, I don't know how you measure a day with the Lord. The Bible tells us that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. But since there's no night in heaven, I don't know how you measure a day. 
One problem in measuring heavenly days is there is no night there. You know, there's no need for rest. There's no need for sunrise and sunset. The heaven is eternally uh, bright and glorious. There's no night time in heaven. But the Bible says that if you want to think about it, and that's just a way to try to get you to understand how dynamic a concept time is with God. Time is nothing with God. God created time. Before, before God created the, the, the morning and the evening, or the evening and the morning was the first day, the evening and the morning was the second day, the evening and the morning was the third day, before God established that pattern for time, there was no time. Eternity has no time. As a matter of fact, the word eternal means it has no beginning and it has no end. So God is eternal. God has no beginning and God has no end. You, however, are not eternal. You had a beginning. You were created by God. You were implanted in the womb of your mother. God birthed you onto this earth. You had a beginning. God began you. But you have no end because you're going to spend the rest of eternity somewhere, either in heaven to be enjoyed or hell to be tortured, according to the Bible. So you are not called eternal. You have everlasting life is what that means. Everlasting means it does have a beginning, but it doesn't have an end. And so God gives you everlasting life. He is eternal. You are everlasting. So but anyway, after God, you know, destroys Satan at the Battle of Armageddon and all the en enemies of the earth are marshaled against tiny little dot Israel, and then, and then he, bind, he takes Satan and he binds him up and he throws him down in the hold in cell of eternity, you know, in Hades or Sheol or whatever term it might be, and he's, and he's bound for a little season. He's not eternally where he's going to be forever, but he's just, he's just wrapped up and put in a hold in cell waiting to go to the big house. And, he, and he's there until that little season is over. Well, on earth, meanwhile, because Satan is bound, that means sin is bound, temptation is bound, uh, wickedness is bound, evil is bound. And on earth, it becomes a paradise. And the Bible says that it's going to last for a thousand years. And this thousand years, Jesus is going to actually step out of heaven, and there's going to be a throne set up in Jerusalem that is the throne of the kingdom of David which is Jesus' lineage that he is in. And all through the Old Testament, the Bible talks about Jesus sitting on the throne of David. Well, that's going to happen actually here on this earth. A literal throne is going to be set up in Jerusalem, and King Jesus is going to sit on a throne for a thousand years and reign over this world that doesn't have temptation, doesn't have evil, doesn't have sin. People are going to be married and given in marriage. People are going to have babies. Things are going to be born. Business is going to be as usual, except there will be no temptation. There will be no devil. There will be no sin. Be... And after a thousand years, everybody say millennium. 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 I know that's a big word, and it might be even a tongue twister. Say it again out loud. Millennium. Millennium, Millennium simply means 1,000. That's all it means is 1,000. It's not a big old theo theological word. It's not some kind of scientific concept. The word simply means 1,000. So when we talk about the millennial reign of Christ, we're talking about the 1,000-year reign of Christ on this earth. At the end of that thousand years, then he's going to take Satan. He's going to loose him for a little season. He's going to be able to get out there and torment and tempt and seduce and blah, blah, blah until some time where Jesus says, okay, uh, that's the end of you. And then he's going to grab him by his nappy little neck, wrap him up, cast him into hell forever, into everlasting torment and fire and he's going to be there, and he's going to cast everybody that follows him and everybody that's been judged and everybody that's been sitting and holding sails, waiting on the big house. There comes the big house, and he will always be there. And the Bible says to show you how insignificant the devil really is. I know everybody thinks about, ooh, big bad demon, big bad Satan, big bad, whoa, he's really something. Oh, he's great. I'll be... He, he's going to be worse than Saddam Hussein down that little rat hole that they found him and drug. Have you seen pictures of him? Looks a little worse than a mug shot. I mean, they finally drug his little self up out of there and his hair is all frizzed out. It looks like some kind of serial killer or something or another. And they finally drug him. He's digging down in the earth trying to run away like a coward and hide. 
and he'd finally drag him out of that little mole hole. And uh, of course, you know what happens now. His own, his own people take him and lynch him or whatever they did to him. But anyway, the, uh, the, the point is that all of, these, all of these concepts of this big frightening demon, this wonderful, majestic, powerful, strong man of hell, and I'm going to party with the devil, and blah, 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 you know, given some kind of, like, he's some kind of hero or superhero, that little frazzling worm, here's what the Bible says about him, that all of those that see him cast into hell, here's what they're going to do. And you'll see this in the book of Revelation. It says it just like this. We're gonna, they're going to walk by, and they're going to look at him, and they're going to wag their head. That's a sign of disrespect. Like, what? And then they're going to say, is this the man that tormented the world? Is this the being that, 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 that we thought was the mastermind of evil? It's like, my, that wormy little dried up piece of nothing down there, that's, that's the devil? They're going to wag their head, and they're going to shame him, and they're going to say, is this the one that deceived the nations? In other words, it's going to be so surprising to people how weak and puny and miserable he is. And so this is what awaits us. So there's actually three. Now, don't get confused. Is everybody okay so far? There are actually three touching of the feet to this earth by Jesus. One was when he was born. One was on the Mount of Olives when he slays everybody at the Battle of Armageddon. The third is when he comes down and sits on a throne in the city of Jerusalem for a thousand years and rules and reigns on this earth. There is another coming of Christ, but he doesn't touch the earth. He just comes in the cloud, and then we go up to meet him. The first catastrophic prophetic event that, that starts all of the other action falling like dominoes, is the return of Christ in the clouds. That's what we're waiting on. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm waiting for that. Amen. Is the coming of Christ in the clouds to call us up. In the book of Revelation, and I'm going to show you, uh, uh, don't get too excited because we're not fixing to bounce into the chapter 4 at the moment. But I wanted to see, at least you can see the first verse of chapter 4, which shows you what begins to happen next. And notice what it said, after these things. What things? After Jesus had these seven letters to these seven churches, after he spoke all of that, and John saw him, you know, as the conquering hero with the sword of fire and the eyes of flame and the brass feet and all of those majestic ways that he was described in chapter 1, talk about the things that you have seen. Chapters two and three talk about the way things are, seven letters to seven churches de denoting seven ages of church life and so forth. And then after that was over, verse one of chapter four says, and after these things I looked, this is John writing, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me. Now, John didn't say a trumpet was talking to him. He said he had a voice like a trumpet. And of course, you know, the voice of a trumpet, I play one every Sunday. I'll guarantee you that that shofar right there, that's what the word is translated, by the way. Anytime you see the word trumpet in the Bible, it's the word, the Hebrew word is shofar, which is that right there. Of course, it could be a little clam shell, you know, a big, like a little round clam shell horn, but it, but it basically makes the same sound, maybe a little lower tone because of its size, but it's still piercing like that. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, every Sunday, the band's playing and the drums are, you know, we're all kind of getting fired up about the start of the service and we're clapping and everything. But when I blow that, it just pierces through every bit of it, doesn't it? You can hear that above everything. I would venture to say that if you turn that stuff up as loud as it could go, and Chris, don't do it, but, but if you did... If, it, if you did turn it up as loud as it could go, I don't have any kind of microphone on that thing at all. I'll guarantee you, you could still hear that as loud as this stuff could go. Why? Because it's just a piercing type of sound. So John said, man, above all of the clamor and above all of the, you'll see the beast flying around the throne crying, holy, holy, and you'll see all this kind of stuff. You'll see what's going on in heaven when this happens. 
But above all of that clamor, clutter, and everything else, John said, I heard a voice, and it sounded like a trumpet, man. I mean, it was like this voice just pierced through everything that was going on around me, and this trumpet said, come up here, which is what I'm professing to you to be the calling of the church up off of earth into heaven. I'm saying John, as a representative of all Christians everywhere, basically is saying that God called me. This trumpet voice said, this Jesus, who is, the, who is the trump of God? A trumpet denotes victory. A trumpet denotes charge. A trumpet plays fanfare when royalty comes by. And this gigantic voice that sounded like a trumpet said, above all the clutter, come up here. And then John is called up off of the earth, just like you and I are going to be called up off of the earth. Just like Thessalonians says that the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet, with them, to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So here we are, here we go, first verse, chapter four, before any else, anything else starts happening on earth, before any of the things which shall be hereafter starts happening down here, we're not here anymore. We're called up, we're gone. And he said, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. So come on up, I'm giving you a new viewpoint. Everything else has happened as John stood on the earth and looked up and saw all of these things, and he said, your vantage point so far has been you standing on the earth and you watching what happened in the heavenlies. Now I'm calling you up to the heavenlies, and we're going to sit here, and I'm going to show you what's happening like, like you're in the grandstands, like you're the spectator of what's happening here on earth. So the next great event that we're waiting on that triggers all of this stuff, which which um, they follow in quick, quick order after this. Once this happens, then everything begins to happen according to a pattern that the Bible gives us the years and the months and so forth about how long it's going to last, when it's going to end, what happens next, and all of that kind of stuff. And that's what we'll be looking at throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. But it all hinges. The hinge pin is when, we call, when he calls us up out of here. Yeah, 16 times. 18, as a matter of fact, I counted them the other day. The word church or churches is used in the first three chapters. Starting with chapter 4 all the way to the end of the book, right at the end of the book, in the last few verses of the book, the word church is used again, but it's basically just an accumulative word said, I've written all this to the church so that it can know what's happening. The church is never mentioned again after chapter, at the end of chapter 3 signifying to me, it's not there. He didn't have any trouble using it through the first three chapters because the church is very much here. The church is very much under siege. The church is very much in, in the big picture. But after, after verse 1, when he says, come up here, it's never mentioned again until the accumulation at the end. And it's just basically saying, I wrote this to the church so you guys could know and so forth. So we're waiting on the rapture of the church. Now, what I have for you today is out of all the things the Bible says, and it says multitudes of things about the, about the coming of Christ. These are the 10 big things that if you ask me, you say, Pastor, why, do, why would you believe that the rapture could happen at any moment? I mean, are there real prophetic things that have been fulfilled, that have been done? Because you'll remember that 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul writes us that the coming of the Lord is like a thief in the night. In other words, it's, it, you don't know when it's going to happen. No thief announces himself in advance and goes, hey, uh, just a little note to you, I'm coming tonight, make sure the door's unlocked. No, a thief in the night comes without any warning, without any forewarning. And Jesus said, that's how, that's how my come up is going to be. All of a sudden, he's going, to step, he's going to step off his father's throne in heaven. Dad says, go get him, son. And he's going to step out there and he's going to say, come home or I'm here or get ready or whatever it might be that he says. And that's the only warning that it's going to be just that quick when the Father's time fulfillment for us to have the opportunity of grace is over with and the patience of God is not going to last forever. 
The, Spirit, the Bible says the Spirit of God will not always strive with men. In other words, there'll come a time when the Spirit of God stops dealing with men. You wouldn't want to be in that time, I can tell you that. I've said to you, if you're sitting in this sanctuary and you're nervous and you're anxious about this, you're a little fearful about this, you can thank God because that's the Holy Spirit inside you keeping you stirred up. You might need to do something. I'm not saying you do. I'm just saying everybody has apprehension, so you know the difference between having a little apprehension and, and really being anxious or fearful about something. But as long as that's there, you know the Holy Spirit is still beckoning you, still wanting you. You know, you can come in here and be cold as an iceberg and sit here and twiddle your thumbs and go, mm, I wish you'd hurry up. And you have no interest in this, you might as well just go on back home because it's over for you. You'll never be saved. You'll never, never be drawn by the Holy Spirit. Because what does the Bible say? Unless the Spirit of God draws you, you can't come to Christ. This might shock you, but you can't come to Christ anytime you want to. You can only come when he's drawing you. I mean, you can say some words anytime, but you can't come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Christ. So you sit here maybe smug and indifferent and, you know, kind of uh, egotistical about, uh, hey, I'll come one day when I'm ready. Yeah, yeah, well, let's hope you do. Let's hope you still have a chance. I'm just telling you why you have a chance. Come on in. Well, this is now the time. Now is the time. Because at any moment, and here are 10 reasons why I believe that Jesus could come today because of these prophetic words that are given in the Bible. Now, let me just say this uh, before I kind of jump into some of these things. Some of these 10, many of these 10, are going to be prophetic events that happen in the tribulation period, in the period of time after this, when this begins to happen on earth. Now, the only thing I, I, I'm designating to you about this is, if some of these prophetic events are going to happen during tribulation, that means the rapture has to come first. So it means if, if, if these things are prophetically filled in the Bible and they could happen during the tribulation, then the rapture has to be closer than that, which means get ready, get ready, get ready, which means if it's already set up that this could happen during the tribulation period, because listen, I mean, think about it logically and reasonably. Uh, all of the events that are described in the rest of the book of Revelation that describe alliances and treaties and preparation and some antichrist sitting on a throne and the whole world bowing at his feet and everybody loves him and everybody's captivated by him. He's the brilliant, beautiful, wonderful, gallant, uh, nice, uh, gorgeous, uh, magnetic personality person that he is, that he just captivates the world and the whole world bows before him and says, he's the king, he's the king, oh, He's so wonderful. For that to happen, somebody has to be in the process of that happening. I mean, it's not going to be we go to bed one night and the next day we, work, we all stand up and go, he's the greatest. You know, I mean, there has to be a process by which somebody is... I, the Antichrist, I believe, is on this earth right now. I believe the Antichrist has been born. This Antichrist may be a child, may be coming up, may be a teenager, may be 20 years old, may be 30. But there's some person on this earth right now that, in my opinion, is the Antichrist. I don't think he's in political office right now. <laughs> I don't think he was in the office before. I don't think it's John Kennedy reincarnated, which a lot of people speculate about or Ronald Reagan, or Jimmy Carter, or any of these guys. But I think he is on the earth right now, and I think he will be made manifest. And I'm just saying, I mean, as humanity rolls along, all of these prophetic things have to be being set up to happen. And if they're being set up to happen, then that means the event that triggers them all can certainly happen at any moment. So I don't want you to get confused about when you see these top 10 things that every one of them happened yesterday, all right? They're just making it possible. When I was 70 years, um, when I was, when I was uh, <laughs> a few years, give me a few years, when I, when, I was, when I was young in the 70s, I was preaching the gospel in the 70s. I know you're shocked because I look so young, but I was... Uh, I was preaching in the 70s. I started, you know, like 1971. I, I preached. I was 18 years old. 
And I preached every Sunday in a little small church that my pastor sent me out to pastor because they had had a big church split and they had a fuss and they needed to either keep to be in a church or shut the doors and sell it or whatever. And he said, why don't you go out there and preach for them because they need somebody and you need the practice. So I, I did, and that's where I started pastoring 43 years ago. So over the period of time, I've preached lots of messages out of the book of Revelation when I was young and fiery and you know, radical and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and combative and, my, you know, and, and just rebellious, you know, how teenagers are. Boy, I would jump on Revelation and just preach hell and fire and damnation. I was a, I was a rover, boy. I, I, I raked them over the coals, up and down one side. The more you wiggle, the better I liked it, you know. But the point being that many of the things that we now know have been accomplished, and we know how they're accomplished, and we can see them already being accomplished and the fulfillment already there, those things didn't exist back then. And it was a big question, how would this ever happen? I mean, we didn't have cell phones. We had no satellite communication, basically. I mean, the military or NASA might have had some, but it wasn't open for everybody like it is now. I mean, it... We didn't know a lot of things. We couldn't imagine how something could happen. Most of us kept our money under a, stuck in a sock under the mattress, you know. Banking did not have any, you know, uh, centralized internet banking, and you couldn't move money back and forth and blah, 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 blah. And we couldn't even imagine how in the world is somebody going to control all the money of the world? A big question was, I can't ever see one person being in control of whether people can buy or sell or do anything with all of their money. Well, we don't worry about that anymore. We know exactly how it happens. Somebody hits the wrong key on an insert in your column and you broke. All your credit cards are shut down. You have no money until you get it straightened out and hopefully you can, you know. Well, it's not complicated anymore how that's going to happen, right? We wondered how we're going to have a mark on our forehead or on the back of our hand, as the Bible talks about, that's called the mark of man. It's the number 666, which six is the number of the weakness of man. Six is one less than seven. Seven is perfection and completion. God, man without God, six without the plus one is incomplete and lost and devastated. Six is the number of man. So there's going to be some number that's associated with those who go through tribulation that they agree to, to have in order to buy and sell, and they, and, and they give allegiance and credence to the Antichrist to do so. And it's either going to be some kind of chip planted in you or some type of, of a scan that's probably not even noticeable except under a scanner of some kind, and you're going to walk through something, and it's just going to scan you, and then it's going to be, yeah, let them buy because they pledge allegiance to the Antichrist, and then let them go. If, if you don't, now remember, this is during the time hereafter. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't care. I'm going to be gone. I'm just telling you, tell your people this. I mean, when, when you have a lost person in your home, say, let me tell you what's going to happen when I leave here. You're going to wake up one day and my bowl of Frosted Flakes is going to be sitting right there where it normally sits and there's going to be a spoon stuck down in it, but you're going to look for me and I'm going to be gone. And whenever that happens, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. And you just, you can tell them, all right, you're going to be, you're gonna, they're going to challenge you. Somebody's going to say to you, if you don't bow down and worship old Antichrist, then you're not going to be able to buy, sell, or nobody's going to be able to help you. You're going to become a rogue and vagabond um, uh, a beggar of life, hiding out from the enemy and hoping nobody discovers you. And look at your neighbor and say, you can run, but you can't hide. They're going to catch you, is what I'm going to say. And then we're going to string you up in the town square and let everybody throw darts at you or something. I mean, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be sad that you didn't pledge allegiance and they're going to kill you. So I know I've heard people say, man, if I miss the rapture, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bow on my knees and I'm going to confess that Christ is Lord because I'm going to realize, man, I missed the boat and it's crazy. And God, I, 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 I know that's what you think you're going to do, but that's not what you're going to do. You're not, you're not ever going to be saved because the lie that the Antichrist says, you're going to believe it. It's going to be worse than it is now with all these crazy news networks saying whatever they want to say delusional is what they are. 
And you're going to believe those things because God's going to send strong delusion according to 2 Thessalonians. And you're going to believe the lie because when you had an opportunity to believe the truth, you rejected the truth because you loved your sin more than you loved God. And God said, oh, you love your sin? All right, I'm going to let you live forever in it. Right here, boom. It won't be fake news anymore. It'll be the real thing. And, 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 and you, you know, you're not going ha- to confess. You're not going to draw. Because when we leave the earth, guess who else leaves the earth? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you is going to be drawn off this earth also. And Thessalonians says, the, the one who now hinders is the way he puts it. Who is it that hinders Satan right now from doing what Satan would love to do to this world? You know what Satan would love to do to this world? He would love to destroy you. He would love to mutilate you. He would love to, to kill people you love. He would, he would love to put disease on you. He would love to just make you a destitute, bankrupt, vagabond on this earth. He would destroy you. He would mutilate you. He would kill you and harm you and, 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 and cause you to weep and cry and have no peace and be full of anxiety. That's what he would do to you if something didn't hinder him from doing it. And 2 Thessalonians says, he who now hinders will continue to hinder until he be drawn up out of the way. Who is it that hinders Satan from doing his evil worse? Everybody say the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that protects you from the enemy killing you right now. The, you, you know the book of Job? Have you ever read the book of Job? The enemy would do what he did to Job to you if he could, but he can't because the Holy Spirit has encapsulated your life like a, like, like, like a, like a bunker against the foe, and the Holy Spirit keeps docked off of you all of the evil of Satan. If you could see the spirit world around you, you would see enemies coming against you and armies of God fighting for you at all times while you're sitting in this sanctuary, while you're walking on the street out there. There's a spiritual battle going on, and the Holy Spirit is hindering that evil monster from destroying your life. Well, guess what? When we're called up, The one that hinders is also called up and all hell breaks loose on earth. No more more restrictions. No more hinderer. No more protector. And so you get left behind, your scraggly little self is history. And it's going to be torturous and torment and persecution and hell and vagabond and running and hiding for your life. And you tell me, that you who can't walk down a church aisle in peace right now in a pleasant place that is designed to call you to this place to this place and you don't have enough courage and boldness and what and, and will to step out and walk down here and say I receive Christ you're going to tell me that you're going to fight through pestilence and dominion and seeking and dead and destruction and all that to come to Christ I'm going to say no you're living a fantasy If you can't do it now, you're certainly not going to do it then when it means your death, your torture, your identification with Christ, which puts you on the hit list of hell during the book of tribulation, during the, the, the time of tribulation. Didn't mean to get off on all that, but I just want you to know it, okay? I'm just saying, yeah, praise the Lord. Look, I just want you to know the people you love, you need to be concerned about their soul. This is, what, this, is, this is the real thing now. This is not fake news. This is not hype them up and get them excited about things. This is what the Word of God says. And that's why the book of Revelation was written, so he could unveil all of this to us, so he could reveal all of this to us, so that we wouldn't be ignorant, which means uninformed. He wants you to be informed. So what are the 10 things? Thessalonians says he comes as a thief in the night. And here's what Matthew adds to that. Matthew said, you know, if the good man of the house, if the, if the, if the master of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have protected his house and not allowed it to be broken into. 
So even though we can't pinpoint the day or the hour where Jesus could come, I, look, I'm telling you, I don't know when Jesus is coming. As far as I'm concerned, I'm ready to go right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, as long as, it, you know what I, I feel about this, and maybe I need to say this to you. Um, as long as you have in you the desire to live, I believe that God is not ready for you to come home. I don't know if you've ever watched this. I've been with lots of dying people over 43 years because as pastors, I live in the entrails of people's disasters. And sickness and death is part of that. And so I've been at many bedsides as people passed on to, to go and be with the Lord. And I've watched them, and I've, some of them have been able to talk. Some of them have not been medicated beyond their reality. And every one of them, without exception, before they went, they basically communicated to me and anybody else standing there, Pastor, I'm ready to go. And as a matter of fact, some of them were hooked up to machines that were keeping their heart beating and their lungs expanding and so forth and all that. They were basically being kept alive by artificial machinery and so forth. And, and, and they would scratch out or somehow communicate out, let me go, let me go. I'm ready to go. That's, I believe that when it's your time, God releases that drive to be alive and that drive to go on and be with him. And you say, well, I don't want to go. Well, okay, that means it's not your time. I had a friend of mine that said he got a sentence of death from a medical report, you know, basically. And he said, and he, and he, pre, and he was a preacher and he said, pastor, he said, man, I, I can't tell you how many times I've preached about what I just said to you is, is labeled dying grace. I can't tell you how many I pre times I preached dying grace and I got the death penalty by a diagnosis of cancer or whatever it might be. And man, I'm telling you, ever since I got that, I have been so afraid. I don't want to go. I'm not out of here. And, I'm not. And, and then I got, went to the next report and the doctor said, hey, we made a mistake and it's not you and blah, 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 blah. And he said, now I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that as a man of God, I stood up and preached dying grace. And whenever the diagnosis was given to me, I got all scared and nervous and anxious about all that kind of stuff. And I'm ashamed because what I said I believed, I might not believe. And I looked at him and I said, but you weren't dying. The reason you didn't have any peace about it is because you weren't dying. The doctors were wrong. <laughs> hey, you weren't dying. So anyway, my point is, that in all of the events that happened, Jesus said, okay, even though you may not know the day or hour, if the good man of the house was paying attention, he would, have, he, would, he would have surmised that the thief was on his way and he would not have allowed his home to be broken into. So I'm saying to you, even though we do not know the day or hour, Jesus doesn't even know it. The angels don't know it, according to the Bible. Only the Father, which is in heaven, has the final word on, okay, son, go get them. Go get your bride. And then Jesus will step out of the portals of glory and step on that cloud, and the old voice of, of an archangel will scream, come on, or whatever it might be, and the trump of God, blah, 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 blah. And then, boy, people, here we go, collecting up from everywhere and going to be with the Lord. Nobody knows when that's going to happen except the Father who has the final word to say, okay, the mansions are ready. You remember what Jesus said about this, John 14? John 14, great word of God. Listen to this. This ought to comfort you, okay? This is why he said this. He said, you believe in God? That's what he said, first verse. You believe in God? Believe also in me. He's talking to his disciples now. He said, you guys believe in God? A lot of people on this earth say, we believe in God. A lot of the religions of the world say, we believe in God. A lot of the belief systems in the world say, we believe there's a God. Well, Jesus said, you believe there's a God? Then you ought to believe in me. You believe there's a God? Well, believe in me also. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if that were not the truth, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to surely come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you might be also. 
And Thomas, one of the disciples, said, Lord, well, Jesus said, and you know the way. And then Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. And how can we know the way? And then that's when Jesus made that marvelous statement that we sang about a few minutes ago. He said, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life and no man comes to the Father but by me. And then he adds this word, comfort one another with these words. In other words, don't worry about it. One of these days I'm going to come get you so that you can be with me forever. And just as soon as I get your mansion built in heaven and the Father looks at that mansion and says like a good dad, yeah, looks like you got enough bathrooms. Yeah, it looks like the nursery's fine. Looks like, oh yeah, you need to do a little bit more work on that little alcove right there. That's not going to be quite ready because the dad has the experience to know what's going to be needed. The son's just anxious to go get his bride. But dad knows, as a good man of the house knows, okay, what are we going to need in that area? What are we going to need in that area? What are we going to need in that area? And as he surveys it, he said, all right, son, just a little bit more work right over there, and then you'll be ready. And the father looks at it, and the father's got his finger ready to touch. Let's go, let's go, let's go. The son is anxiously working and hurrying, trying to get everything prepared. He comes back, he looks at dad, he says, now, dad? He said, no, just a little bit more. Uh, all right, now, dad? Okay, come on. Uh, uh, but, but, but when that mansion gets ready, God's going to say to his son, go get your bride. And Jesus says, when he opens that door, I'm coming for you. When that mansion is prepared, I'm going to come and receive you to myself, that where I might be, you'll be with me always, and then comfort one another with these words. Well, if the good man of the house, I know that this world we're living in can't see the preparation that's on the horizon for all of this to happen. Nobody knows the day or the hour. I'm not telling you it's tomorrow. I'm not like that slogan in 1988 says 88 reasons why Jesus could come in 88. I mean, that was a good shot at everything, but they missed it. The only thing wrong with it is it was wrong. You know, I could have told you, and as a matter of fact, I did. If you could go back and listen to, of course, back then it was cassette tapes. If you could go back and listen to some of the cassette tapes of my messages back then, you would be hearing me say something similar to this. I know Jesus is not coming in 1988. You know how I know? Let's just say this guy that wrote this book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Could Come in 88. Let's just say he stumbled on something and just accidentally got it right. I'm just saying to you, if he even accidentally got it right, the Lord would change it just to spite him. Because the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. Not even the Son not even the angels that are in heaven. Michael doesn't know. Gabriel doesn't know. None of them know. And so we don't know, but we're, what about the good man of the house? Are you a good man of the house? Are you someone watching over your household, your spiritual life, your spiritual family? Are you papa of the house? Are you paying attention to what's going on around the windows in your home and around the doors in your home? Do you have the locks? Are they bolted? When you went to bed tonight, was everything latched up? Was the garage door closed? Who makes sure that's happened? That's you, isn't it, Dad? That's the protector of the house, making sure the house is as safe as it can be while the family goes to sleep. Oh, the kids never thought about it, but you did, didn't you, Dad? Your wife may have gotten in the bed and said, did you latch the door? Oh, yeah, I did. Why? Because you check it every night because you want to protect your family. Matthew says, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. And I'm just saying to you, even though we may not know the day or hour, we can recognize the seasons of things, and we are the good man of the house. I don't want my family to be caught by surprise. So I want to make sure the people I love are ready to go. 
So I'm watching the seasons. I'm watching the flow of prophecy. I'm watching the timings of God. I'm listening to the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. I'm getting all riled up about the things of, the, of God that are rolling around in me and the prophetic words that God says, here's what this means. Let me show you this. I might have read these verses a thousand times and never come to the same conclusion as I do now because the Holy Spirit is trying to make sure as the good man of the house, which I have a bunch of of houses here to, to, to speak to, to stand like a herald warning you about get ready, get ready, get ready, because the season is now. I mean, the only thing that delays it is God is so merciful and gracious that he keeps holding off time to give more and more people an opportunity to get saved. But when that last person on this earth comes to him, and he knows there are no others that would, are on the verge of coming to him, then that may be the end of the, of the period of grace. We call it a dispensation. And that's a theological word, but it just means a period of time. There was the dispensation of innocence where Adam and Eve lived innocently in the garden. There was the dispensation of conscience when they sinned and realized they had sinned against God. There was the dispensation of of covenant when God made a covenant with Abraham and promised him things. There was a dispensation of law when God took Moses on the mountain and gave him the Ten Commandments. Now we're living in a dispensation of grace where Jesus Christ came and we can be forgiven of our sin. This dispensation is going to end and it's going to be the dispensation of judgment, the book of Revelation, the tribulation period, and all these horrible things. The next period of time, we're right at the end of the dispensation of grace where God holds open the door and says, come on in, you're welcome. When that dispensation ends, God's not going to deal with grace anymore. He's going to deal with judgment. You don't want to be alive in judgment. You say, what are the things hereafter? The end of the dispensation of grace and the start of dispensation of judgment or justice. The justice of God is sure this world's going to get its comeuppings one day. Every one of you deal with credit cards and banknotes, right? Okay, you get the money now and uh, uh, you spend it and you enjoy it and you live high, wide, and handsome and it's, oh, thank goodness, man, we are going out to eat or we're going to travel in our automobile or we rented a motel room or whatever it might be you use the money for and you enjoy it now. But about 30 days from now, there's going to be a little bill that comes in the mail or over some electronic transfer and everybody say, come up and... Come uppins is happening. Well, in life, there are come uppins. Everybody's going to get their come uppins. This world is, I mean, I know your old lost neighbors that cuss and rant and rave and party in the streets and have no thought of God. I know you look at them and you go, how can they be blessed? And they make money and they live in And they may look like they're high, wide, and handsome and living wide and free. And it may look like there's no justice in this world, but I'm telling you, their comeuppance is coming. And the tribulation is comeuppance. Everybody's going to get you comeuppance. Either you're going to allow the blood of Jesus to cover up all of your anarchy against the kingdom and all of your pride and arrogance against the things of God and the blood of Jesus at the cross of Christ as you bow and say Jesus is Lord is going to cover your sin or else you're going to pay for it yourself. And the choice is yours. But remember, this period ends at some point and justice begins. So, I want to be a good man of the house. So I have yet to get to the first point, right? Everybody say, I'm not surprised. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Oh, that's just the introduction. Okay, I got the end. I'm not, I'm not going to keep you forever, but let me just give you the first one, okay? Let me give you the first one. The first one, all right, this is, this is beginning of, of chapter 4. Here's the first reason why I believe that Jesus come right now. The rise of doubters and skeptics. Would it surprise you that the Bible tells us that this craziness that we're in right now is something that points to the fact that it's time for him to come? The very fact that all of this fake news, delusional reporting, craziness in this world in spite of all evidence, in spite of no, no evidence, in spite of everything, people just make stuff up. People just 
think in their mind and think, okay, this sounds good to say. Let's just say it. And everybody, it goes out over all the broadcast airwaves. You know something I watched this week? And I'm not trying to be political. Believe me, listen, I, I, I don't want to have to throw out a disclaimer every time I say something that's political. You guys, look, I don't, I don't have any belief. G, King Jesus is the only one I believe in. I don't care who's president or who's in Congress or who's a mayor of Gulfport or whatever it might be. I try to make a good choice. I vote in every election, but I don't ever talk about it, and I'm not going to talk about it because I'm not up here to talk about politics. And I don't have any you know, hidden agenda and blah, 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 blah. I'm not talking to Congress. I'm not talking to the international media. I'm talking to you guys about the Bible and the truth. Now, it's going to sound political when I say certain things, but... I hope you know my heart, and, and, and I'm not trying, but, but, but I'm just saying this. I watched this past week. This is just an example of doubters and skeptics and delusion that's on this earth. I saw in London, as, when, when, when our President Trump was over there, he was just visiting with the, he went to see uh, Prime Minister May, and he went to see the Queen of England, like every one of our presidents have since John Kennedy. Johnson didn't go, but every other president went and met with the Queen, and, you know, and was all nice and sweet, and they had a good little talk, and it was on TV. You know, I mean, it was just that little uh, diplomatic kind of stuff that presidents of the United States do. But over there, there were these protesters out in the street. I mean, like, a thousand of them or something like that. I mean, you know, a throng of protesters protesting our president for, you know, they went with the cameras, <laughs> the mics, say, hey, what you protesting about? We hate Trump. Uh, well, why do you hate Trump? Well, uh, uh, well, he puts children in cages or something. I mean, some ridiculous, uh, they didn't even know why they were there. They were there because they've watched media They've tuned in on the internet. They've, uh, they've had Facebook. They've had stuff. And everybody says all these crazy things. And now you've got a thousand people out there protesting somebody. They don't even know why they're protesting. They just hate them. That's all they know about it. Well, that happened when Obama was president. That happened when George Bush was president. That happened when Bill Clinton was president. It I mean, it, but, but it's, just, it's just delusional is what it is. Now, the very fact that that is happening, and keep in mind now, this is the key to, to all this stuff I'm talking about. I know that stuff has happened for years and years, and you could be saying right now, well, Pastor, that's, that's been happening for the past 30 years. I know it has. I rest my case. The Bible says, according to 1 Thessalonians, that the days of these kind of events are only important when you see them coming like birth pains on a woman with child. Here, here's what I'm saying to you. I'm saying to you, even though these kind of events have been happening all along, now they're happening with deeper intensity and more and more and more, they're closer and closer together. Has there been a day, think about it. Has there, I'm going to fall off this thing one day. Has there, has there been a day in the last five years where there hasn't been more delusional things every day than you've ever seen in your life? I mean, it seems like every day there's a new delusion. Yep. We haven't had any peace. We haven't had any rest. We haven't had to, to, to be able to draw breath without somebody being criticized, something being goofy, reporting about some crazy stuff that's just ridiculous, so propagandized and biased. It's just unbelievable. Has there ever been? I mean, you can't even turn on a, a family magazine show and not get propagandized. Right. Somebody's point of view, somebody's opinion, are you for me or against me and blah, blah, blah. And it happens every day. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And it's getting wilder and wilder and wilder and wilder. And it's happening more and more and more and more. That's like birth pains on a woman. I'm not, I haven't had a baby, but I've been there when several, when several were born. And I tell you what I've watched, I've watched it get woo, harder and harder and closer and closer. And then whenever the birth was coming down, uh, battle's over. I mean, you can't stop it halfway down, you know? I mean, it's coming maybe. I mean, it's moving. And that's the event. So the very fact that there are doubters and skeptics and it's getting worse and worse and it's getting more and more intense, let me just show you what the Bible says. 
This is just one of the things the Bible says about this. There are other scriptures, but this is representative. Look at what it says in 2 Peter 3. Knowing this first. Now, what he's doing in 2 Peter 3, what's come before verse 3 is he says, let me tell you about the end of times and let me tell you what to be prepared for. and Let me tell you about how to recognize things. And so we come in in the middle of verse 3 knowing this first. So before what I just said in verses 1 and 2 happens, you need to know this first. Knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days according to their own lust, their own points of view, their own political agendas their own drives, their own financial interests, their own prejudices. They have their own lust in charge, and they're scoffing. It'll never happen, they say. It, 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 this world is crazy, they say. This world needs a new leader, they say. This management style is wild and weird. We need to reject this. We need to rebel. Let's tear down the United States. Let's be anarchists. All of that kind of... Uh, uh, of, of evil spirit moving against things that are valued, like the family, like life, human life. All of the things that are happening, and I'm, I know if you paid attention, you can see this. Everything that makes a, a nation great, everything that makes a life great, everything that makes your family great is being attacked every day, every moment, every day right now. Well, let's tear down the family. Well, it's the family that makes this country great. Well, let's tell them they don't need a dad. They can have two moms or two dads. or They don't have, you have to have women. You can have babies and you don't even need a dad in it and everything's going to be fine. And the only thing wrong with that is it's wrong. God designed a family to have a mama and a daddy and their children living in the same house. And our old country and our laws and our Supreme Courts and our regulations and our goofy, crazy uh, votes and all that kind of stuff are just an attempt to tear down the family so it can't be strong. The foundations of our world are being shaken. Human life. The fact that, uh, that, that, that somebody is conceived and they have life from the moment they're conceived, they are a soul for God. Heart beating, life going, finger nails, you know, fingerprints, uh, uh, DNA, uh, blood, all of that begins to develop very quickly within a few days after conception and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and somebody has the right to kill that person because that person is not outside. Devalue human life. Life is a protoplasm of uh, cells. What is that? That's an attack against humanity. That is an attack against human life and the value of human life. It's being attacked. It's being destroyed. It's being, we don't need that. It's a woman's right. Blah, 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 blah. It's an evil from hell. And it's an attack at the foundation of what makes people great. Being attacked every day. Discipline. I could just, man, I could preach forever on all these. Discipline. You got the right to protest. You got the right to challenge people. You got the right to uh, go attack them at a restaurant. Go attack them outside the house. Go make life miserable for them. Blah, blah, blah. Come on, man. The dignity of people's individual lives. That's an attack against uh, uh, leadership. It's basically, there are no disciplines in life. Just open the doors and let the wild horses run and you got the right to... Blah, 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 blah. All it is is anarchy. And I hope you teach your kids to respect other people. It's ridiculous. But, that's, you, but you see it happening, right? I mean, you see, you see the rise of doubters and skeptics. And this very thing, they were saying, that Jesus said, here's what they're going to say. You said Christ is coming, but he hadn't come back. And, and this world has been the same ever since it began. So where's your Jesus? Where's your coming back? You're just telling us something and my, my, my. And they're just mocking and scoffing and blah, blah. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Huh? They're not being deceived. They're choosing to be deceived. They willingly, because they have an agenda, because they have a political point of view. 
because they have a direction. And it's self-centered, self-focusing, self-driven. And they willingly choose to be ignorant that the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing in water and in water. In other words, they knowingly refuse to accept God as their king. Oh yeah, theories of evolution, global warming. Good night. As if somehow puny, arrogant man is in charge of this world. Come on, man. You can't even make a blip on this world. All of us together can't make a blip on this world. This whole country can't make a blip on this world. You let one volcano burp. You don't even, it doesn't even have to explode. It can just burp, belch, belch enough uh, into the ozone layer to change the, the weather cycle in certain parts of the earth. And, and you, puny little man, you're going to do something to global warm the place? Come on. Who do you think you are? How arrogant are you to think that you can control anything God himself has control over? It's ridiculous. But that's going to be the spirit of the age. And the very fact that we see it happening like we're seeing it happen, and it's getting worse and worse, seriously. It's, being, it's just blowing out of proportion, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to get more, and it's going to get deeper and deeper and deeper, and that in itself is one of the signs that the time is drawing near. And even though it's always been happening, it ain't happening like it is now. And with all of the connections with Facebook and Twitter and Twitter and all that other kind of junk and, and these crazy, uh, what do they call them, uh, where people can send these little Snapchat junk and all that. I mean, all of that kind of uh, technology and all of this has never been and it's just being used to make things wilder and crazier and more ridiculous than they've ever been. And it's going to get worse. And the very fact that that's happening is one of the signs of the soon return of Christ. Now, there are nine more <laughs> that I'll get next time. <laughs> All right, I need to let y'all go, man. Those Presbyterians, those Presbyterians have had a free ride. Yeah, right. The Presbyterians have beat y'all to the restaurant in the last uh, six, six to eight weeks or more, at least. Maybe longer than that. We're going we're gonna to get them today. All right, stand to your feet. All right. Stand. <laughs>